Start and go. Okay, so we're gonna start with the word of the day, okay? And uh, hopefully my Gamara students uh, know this. Who can define, uh, give a working definition of Midrash Agada? A non-halachic um, text, writings, maybe? Good. Chazal? Okay, excellent, right? A non-legalistic teaching author by Chazal. Take care of it. Sorry, what was that? Oh, was that someone unmuted? Oh, let me mute people. Uh, okay, anyway, yeah, so Ayala, you got it right. Um, so what, uh, non-legalistic, non-halakhic teaching authored by Chazal. Um, so strictly speaking, if you use the word Midrash Agada, I didn't actually incorporate this into my Torah Pet terminology. Midrash Agada is when it's a teaching based on a Pasuk, uh, whereas Agada, this is a better definition of just Agada. Now, what would be examples of genres of, of Midrash Agada, like what types of ideas? Science. Yeah. Science, good. Medical. What else? Medical stuff. Philosophy. Philosophy, okay, good, right. Ethics, uh, um, historical uh, narratives, uh, Torah books of interpretations. Now, in high school, I only taught you the definition, but uh, I didn't show you the source, okay? So if you have never seen the source of this definition, if you open up, and uh, you don't have to do this now, if you open up a, um, a Talmud Bavli Brachos and you look at the end, you'll find something called the Mavoha Talmud by Shmuel Hanagid, who was an early Rishon. Um, and it's, it means the intro to, introduction to Talmud. And so that's where I got the definition from. And here's, here's it in his words so you can see it. He says, um, a Hagada, which is the Hebrew word for uh, Agada, or, or a different word for Agada. Actually, Agada, I guess, is the Aramaic word. I, I don't know. It's a different word. Um, it's any explanation from the Talmud on any topic. mitzvah, which is not a mitzvah. Zohi Hagada. This is Agada. And then he gives us the rule, which if only they taught this in elementary schools. You should only learn from it what makes sense. Okay. Um, so if it doesn't make sense, then you don't, there's no obligation to accept it. Okay. And he then goes on and he clarifies why. He says, Oh, I forgot when I'm doing this uh, Friday seminar. I'm not going to read the Hebrew. Uh, I'll just display it on the screen. It's just going to take too long. So it is incumbent upon you to know. I'm going to read the Hebrew if, 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 if the language matters. Uh, it is incumbent upon you to know that whatever Chazal established as halacha regarding any mitzvah topic was received by Moshe Rabbeinu who received it from the Almighty and we should not add to it nor subtract from it. Now, obviously he doesn't mean anything that they establish as a mitzvah, because there's such a thing as as Durabanans that they didn't get from Sinai. But he means in general, like anything that is rooted in a mitzvah, like uh, one of Taryag, that came from, uh, from ha Moshe who got it from Hashem. Okay. But as for all the explanations of the, of the psukim, each of the sages explained according to the ideas which occurred to him and what he saw with his mind. And whatever makes sense from these explanations, we should learn, but the rest we shouldn't rely on. So in other words, if it's an explanation of a mitzvah, you, you have no right to say, oh, I'm only going to accept it if it makes sense, because it comes from God, right? You accept it even if it doesn't make sense. But if it's uh, not a mitzvah, if it's a gada, so then it's like any other commentary, and there's no psak outside of halacha. There's no psak in philosophy. So if you accept the interpretation and it makes sense to you, then you accept it. And if you don't, then you leave it, okay? Um, so that's, that's our premise that we're working with here for Agata. Now, that was our intro because uh, we're going to be doing Agata today, okay? But anyone have any uh, questions on this um, intro to, uh, uh, or on, on this definition of Agata? Obviously, we could spend a decade, but yeah. Since when do we, like, we reject, like, things that are based in like morals. Like I know that we reject like scientific ideas from hmm. sages, but not like- so Maybe reject is too strong of a word. Like you see, he uses the word hashar in somkin aleim, that we don't rely on it. So if someone gives you a piece of moral advice that, um, that doesn't make sense to you and it's not halakha, so then you don't have to rely on that. You should only, in other words, in halakha, you do what is obligated, but outside of halakha, you do what makes sense to you um, and if it doesn't make sense to you, then you, then you uh, don't do it. That's what he's saying. So like, if you saw something, for example, um, that said, uh, you know, let's say you see a midrash that says, what is the best way to discipline your child is you take a leather strap and you hit them on the hand with it. Right. So that's something that was very common back then. Uh, we now know that you can traumatize your kids if you do that too much. Right. So, 
so it's not like we're bound by that just because Chazal said it, because it's not halakha, you know? So if we now have, uh, you know, maybe that's not moral advice. Maybe you could say that that's part of uh, science, but, you know, that would be like the example. It was like, you know, you should punish your kids with corporal punishment, you know? Um, if, if that doesn't make sense to you, then don't accept it. Okay, let's move on uh, because we have a lot to do. So we are going to do a midrash today, okay? And I call, I title this year, The Curious Tale of Sasson and Simcha, all right? Um, so this is a, uh, a midrash, and I'm going to show you the... Uh, the Hebrew, which takes three slides, and then um, uh, I'll, I'll display it all in English on one slide after that. Okay, so there were two heretics, right? And again, a heretic is someone who denies the fundamentals of Torah. Okay, there are two heretics, one named Sason and one named Simcha. Sason said to Simcha, I'm better than you. As it is written, Sason the Simcha Yasigu. They will attain Sason and Simcha. Simcha said to Sason, I am better than you. As it is written, Simcha v'sason la'yehudim. There was Simcha and Sasson for the Jews. Now, pause. What, what are they doing with these Pesukim? Like, how, how are they getting that, that who, he's better than, than him? One is the order of the words. The order of the words, exactly, right? <laughs> so, like Rashi says here, so Sasson says to Simcha, I'm better than you, because it says Sasson v'simcha. I came first in the Pesuk, so I'm better. And then Simcha says to Sasson, no, no, no. Simcha v'sason la'yehudim. So, Simcha is better, Okay. So that, that's, that's the first part of the Midrash. Okay, second part. I mean, this is all continuous in the Gemara, but Sasson said to Simcha, one day they will reject you, or uh, really, Shavkucha literally means to abandon you. Rashi says, you will be expelled from heaven. Okay, I'm not sure what that means. Um, and they will make you into a parvanka, a scout. As it is written, for you shall go, ki uh, besimcha teitseu. They're going to go out with Simcha. So meaning, Simcha is going to go out, okay? Rashi uh, defines it. He says, what is a parvanka? It's a scout, a runner to run before him. And what does it mean, besimcha teteu? Um, it says, he will see the paths and pass through the waterways. My understanding of this is, let's say you are in an army and you are uh, trying to cover new territory. So you can't simply march the army in one direction and hope for the best because what if the way is blocked? Or like, what if, you know, what if there's no, what if there's no path? So you've wasted the entire like motion of the army. So instead what you do is you send out a scout, the scout makes sure that there are viable paths. And then with the waterways, let's say you see a, um, a, a river. Okay. And you want to know, can I march my army through the river? So you send the scout out and what, how does the scout determine if the army can march across the river? He marches through it first. He marches through. And I guess if he, sinks you know and it's too deep then i guess that's not a good path right or maybe they had like sticks and stuff to like try to measure the depths i don't know what the system was back then so the point is is that this is like a scouting mission type scout uh who goes in front of everyone before they go okay so then simcha says to sason one day they will reject you and then this part is ambiguous in the aramaic umalu bach maya either means they will draw water with you meaning like you will be a water drawer like you'll be the one to like go get the water or Umalu bach maya, they will fill you with water because bach could either mean with or in. Okay. Um, Dixiv, famous pasuk, ushavtem mayim besasan. You shall draw water with sasan. Okay. So again, he's taking this literally. They will draw water with you, sasan, right? Not with, because, oh, I, I forgot to mention this, by the way. We're, the word sasan and simcha are just synonyms for joy. Okay. So, but that's like the premise of this thing. But he's taking the pasuk as it's a reference to sasan. They will draw water with sasan or they will draw water in sasan. Okay. Third part of the Midrash. Amr oh, sorry. Uh, the heretic named sasan said to Ribia Bahu. Now, if you've learned uh, your way around Gemara, you will know, or you can infer, Rabbi Bahu is an actual rabbi, okay? Like, this is a real person. So the heretic named Sasson said to Rabbi Bahu, you are destined to draw water for me in the, in the world to come. As it is written, you shall draw water bisasson. Rabbi Bahu said to him, if it had been written lisasson for Sasson, then it would have been like you said. But now it is written bisasson. What does it mean? <laughs> okay, if you're squeamish, cover your ears. It means that the skin of that man will be made into a canteen and we will draw water with it. So they're going to skin you alive, or not alive, maybe they'll skin you dead. They'll skin you, take your skin, tan it into leather, and make it into like a water bottle, and we're going to draw water with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the world to come. In the world to come. Now, he's using the word world, world by the way, uh, this is a, a good thing to know, by the way. The, world, the, 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 the phrase world to come, according to the Ramam, the Olam Haba is, um, is non-physical. 
And according to the Ramban, then it is another world, uh, another word for uh, Yemos Mashiach. But even the Ramban holds that the Gemara sometimes uses it for Yemos Mashiach. So here we're talking about in the time of Mashiach, then your skin is going to be made into a canteen and they're going to draw water with it. Okay, so this is Sasson's skin? Sasson's skin, that yeah. What talking about? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so this is, this is the translation as a whole, okay, if you want to look at it. And um, if we had more time, I would uh, ask, uh, we would, you know, we would do what we usually do is uh, I would ask you to try analyzing it on your own. But for now, I'm just going to ask this question, okay? To, to your mind, what are the major questions or problems with this thing? What do you say the major question or problems are? Who or what are Sasson and Simcha? Yeah, who or what are Sasson and Simcha? Are these two actual heretics? Or is this like a muscle for something? Okay. And what would, what would indicate that they are actual people? That they interact with a real person. They interact with a real person, right? So like that leads you to believe that this was an event that actually happened, you know? Side note, by the way, it's interesting that you find people named Simcha, but you don't find people named Sasson. Sassoon is a last name, you know? But I, I've, I mean, I've never met anyone named Sasson, but it's just side point here. Okay. Uh, what are the other questions or problems? Why are they assuming that like they're gonna reject you one day from those Pesukim? Because if yeah, those okay, good. Up. Right. So we understand kind of what they're getting at with saying I'm better than you and I'm better than you. But how do the Pesukim show that you're gonna be rejected, especially if you take Rashi and you'll be expelled from heaven? I mean, what does that even mean? Um, I have a question or like drawing something that I'm picking up on. Sure. Simcha seems and Sasson seem to be um, drawing on different illusions. Some are like Sukkis oriented and like B'nai Israel specific, and then some are um, outside of just B'nai right. Israel. So I'm curious if that's drawing uh, to a okay. larger idea. Good question. So this is, I'm going to phrase that as a methodology question, okay, okay, which is when they quote these Psukim, how important is the context in your mm -hmm. interpretation of the Midrash? And that, you know, you see this going both ways, right? Clearly they don't care about the yeah. context, they just care about who comes first in the Pasuk. But when we're learning the idea, do we take the context into consideration? And if we do, so then as you're saying, you know, I think the Pasuk, the first Pasuk Yeshayahu, uh, I don't remember what the context of that is. I think it's Yimos Mashiach. Esther is obviously about when they got, you know, redeemed uh, the Purim story. Um, Yeshayahu here, you should go out with Simcha is also about Mashiach. And then the other Yeshayahu one is also about Mashiach. Oh, sorry, that's a miscitation. I think it's 6-3, not 12-3. All right, sorry. Um, but anyway, that's also about um, uh, Yimos Mashiach. And it's also, you said Sukkot. What, what halakha and Sukkot do we learn I from? I thought we were talking, I, I misunderstood the Pasuk. So that's, that's. Oh, no, no, no. So, but you might still be right. What, um, what? The Nisa Chamayim. Nisa Chamayim, yeah. So this is one of the, um, the allusions to Nisa Chamayim, to the water libations on Sukkot. And that's actually how my Chavrusa and I got to this Gemara. As we said, let's learn about Nisa Chamayim. And this is the first Gemara uh, uh, um, statement in that Gemara. Okay, so and in the interest it's of going to help us understand who Sasson and Simcha are as well. Right, exactly. So that would be the question is, is what are they bringing or can this shed light on, on who they are? Now, these are all good questions, okay? Oh, obviously, we have to ask what does it mean that he's going to take his skin and make it into a canteen, all right? The general question we're going to deal with here is what's the point of the Midrash, <laughs> okay? If we can just, and, and this is something that, like, uh, you know, I have learned a lot of Mishle. And at this point in my life, I feel pretty confident that I know what a Mishle idea feels like and looks like. When it comes to Midrash, I'm still working on that. I don't have a solid notion of like what, what types of ideas are taught in Midrashim. So at this point in my development, like as a learner, I'm trying to basically take a bunch of Mepharshim and read a lot of Mepharshim and Midrashim and just get, if I get a basic idea, I'm satisfied even if I don't explain the entire thing. So what I want to, what I uh, have prepared for you today is, um, four approaches to this Midrash, okay? Um, to give you a smattering of different approaches and you can obviously take whichever one makes sense to you. Like the, um, you know, if if one comes to the Midrash itself, you should only take what makes sense. Kava Homer, the interpretations of the Midrash, okay? Um, so um, because of that, I am actually gonna do something which I don't know if you've ever seen me do. If you have, maybe it was a lot of the student, my older students know this. So usually I present to you the Mepharshim and just show how they make sense, okay? I don't say, oh, this one is wrong, okay? <laughs> um, typically, I don't do that. Maybe, maybe if you quote an opinion, I might say it's wrong, but I don't typically look through the Mepharshim and say it's wrong. Um, 
I think this first opinion is wrong. Okay. And I'm teaching it to you because I think it's going to help you have a fundamental principle in how to approach Midrashim. And, I, and it's going to steer you away from a fundamental error. And because I'm going to condemn this as wrong and I'm condemning it in harsh terms, I'm not going to tell you who it is. Okay. Cause I don't want it to seem like I'm disrespecting it because this is from a Talmud Chacham. Okay. So we're not even going to go through this whole commentary. You're going to see why, uh, maybe what I find objectionable from the beginning. Okay. So here's how he starts off. He says, seemingly, even though everything that the Tzedukim, now remember Tzedukim is a specific type of heretic who denied Torah Shabal Peh. And it seems like a lot of the Mepharshim hold that these are about Tzedukim because Shane Alea, why would we be talking about Tzedukim if we're talking about the water libations? They poured the water on the floor. Because they poured the water on the floor because they denied uh, the Torah Shabal Peh, the Halach Lomosh Sinai. So a lot of the Mepharshim assume that these heretics are Tzedukim. So Seemingly, even though everything that the Tzedukim were arguing about and what Rabbi Abahu said are words of nothingness, divri hevel heim, nevertheless, the words of Rabbi Abahu were certainly said according to halacha, and they require analysis. So then he goes on and he says, uh, he brings in the Shochan Arach and the Gemara Sanhedrin and a Tosfos and says, I'll summarize it, that it's usher to derive benefit from the burial shrouds of a corpse. Okay, meaning if you have a dead He's body. He's halachic? Okay, hold on just a second. Okay, you're, you're, okay, you're, you're picking up on, uh, on this here. So if, if uh, so you're, it's usher to take anything that belongs to a dead body, um, like, a, or not belongs to, but is used for a dead body, like um, like the, uh, the, the garments, and to use them, okay? So it's usher bahana, it's usher to derive benefit. So the Toso says, if it's usher to d- get benefit from a burial shroud, kalvahomer, you cannot get benefit from the skin of a corpse, and then he says, it is clear that the skin of a corpse is prohibited for benefit. If so, how can Rabbi Abahu say that they're going to make his skin into a canteen? It's prohibited to drive enjoyment therefrom. Then he goes into a whole thing of, it's a machlokis if it's the skin of a non-Jew, whether it's us or to derive benefit from it. And he goes through a whole analysis to describe how, um, how Rabbi Abahu can say that the skin of this heretic can become a canteen. Now, Shayna Leia picked up on what was bothering me. Shaylena, would you like to articulate what's bothering you? He's taking an agada and he's deriving halachic um, ramifications. And yeah. Yeah, okay. And then on so, top of that, it just seems very odd. Yes, okay, good. So in my opinion, there are two possible causes of why this Mefarish did this. And I am going to give a Don Lakaf Zuchus approach and a Don Lakaf Chova approach, Okay. The Don Lakafzuchus approach is he chose not to explain the entire dialogue. And then he saw that at the very end, it makes a point that he, he could expand upon halakhically. So he decided to like write his whole commentary on that halakhic point. Okay. The Don Lakaf Chova approach is when he said, you notice what, how he introduced this. He says, even though everything that the Tzedukim were arguing about and what Rabbi Abahu said are hevel, okay, so the Don Lakaf approach is when he said that the first part of the Midrash is Hevel, he meant it's worthless. Okay, and that's why he didn't explain it, which either indicates that he has a wrong idea of what Midrash Agada is in general, or he classified this as a Midrash Halacha and only focused on the Halachic parts and just ignored the non-Halachic parts. Okay, and this is why I think that this is a mistake. Okay, that, um, you know, look, I'm not an expert on, uh, on Midrash and the person who wrote this approach has learned way more Gemara than I have. So look, he, he's entitled to his own approach. I think it is a severe mistake to just throw out the whole first part of the dialogue between Sasan and Simcha and then say that the point of this Midrash is to teach you a halakha about whether you can use a non-Jew skin to derive benefit from. Okay, I'm planting my flag and saying I think that that's wrong. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I saw your hand, Ayal, but just interrupt next time because I can't see if anyone else is raising their hands. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, like, I didn't read the whole thing. Yeah. But could he just be saying, could he be using that to show that it can't be literal? Like, he's saying sins. No, he he wants to say it is literal, because he's saying that Rabbi Bahu literally is saying that that this guy's skin is going to be made into a canteen. Well, maybe he's saying, I mean, I didn't read it, so I don't know if this is what he's saying or not. Yeah. But could he be saying that since it seems like Abba was saying that his skin is going to be made in canteen, but halacha, but like that wouldn't make sense for Abahu to say that. So it can't be literal and we have to, whatever. No. So he's, he's saying the opposite. He's saying that, um, 
uh, avon dibri ribi abahu vadai neemru kahalacha. So he's saying the one thing is for sure is he he wouldn't make a statement that's not halakhically accurate. So I guess you could say regardless of whether he's taking the midrash literally, he's taking that statement that it has to be accurate. Okay, and he's saying that if it, you couldn't have a midrash where, where a halakhic person says something that is not halakhically accurate. Okay. Or he's saying he Abahu wouldn't say something which is unhalakhically accurate, so right. it must be Abahu didn't say it. No, no, he is saying that Rabbi Abahu says it because he does go through the whole analysis to show how this could be the case. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on again in the interest of time. This is such a short, <laughs> short, short time period. Anyway, so approach number two is from the Rav, from Rasul Vechik, and the Maharsha. Okay, it's not exactly the same approach, but they take the same basic approach. Um, so the Rav says like this. Um, it is reasonable to assume that this anecdote came here in order to mock the tzedukim who explained the psukim in accordance with their literal meaning without the tradition of Torshbal Peh, and to demonstrate how, according to the corrupt methodologies, they distort even the pshatim of the psukim, as is evident from the wild pshatim that they stated about these psukim. So he's saying that the purpose of this is to show how flawed the interpretational methods of the tzedukim were, okay, and to mock them. Okay, and this is something that we do, is we do hold that you should mock people who are, you know, intentionally denying Torah Shabbat Peh, okay? Um, not someone who's a Tino Kshanishba who was raised that way, but let's say, for example, you know, when the reform movement was first started, it is a mitzvah and an obligation to mock the people who are trying to lead Jews astray, okay? Um, the Maharsha says something similar, but he elaborates a little bit. Uh, he says, such is the method of the heretics to explain the Pesukim in reference to themselves in accordance with their foolishness and futility. Okay, so he says the same thing as the Rav there. They explain it in reference to themselves. And their refutation is close by, even according to their errors. Uh, that, what that means is there's a Gemara somewhere, I, f- I forgot to look it up before this, that says anytime you have a, a, a reading of a Pasuk that is a heretical reading, you'll find the refutation close by. And I think, I don't know if it's Rashi or someone else says it on this week's Parsha, that says, Na'ase Adam Betelim no, let us make man in, in our form and like our likeness, which implies, so that the heretics are going to say, oh, you, you see there's multiple gods. Na'ase, we, let us make. But then right next to it, it says, Vaya'as Elohim uh, as Adam Batamo, right? Uh, that God, God singular made. So the reputation is close by. So same thing here. This one says, I'm first in the Pasuk. And this one said to the contrary, I'm first in the Pasuk. Thus both are false and neither Pasuk refers to them. Okay, so in other words, he's saying it's obvious that none of their arguments are good, okay? And likewise, in the sequel in which Sasson said to Simcha, one day they will reject you and make you into a scout, according to his erroneous reading in the manner of mocking his fellow heretic, to which his friend said the opposite, they will reject you and fill you with water. Both of them retracted from their errors in explaining the Pesukim this way. So the point, according to the Rav and the Maharsha, is to show that these um, Sudukim will twist the Pasuk to fit their own agendas and to show how that's just stupid. And we see, by the way, that uh, Reform Jews do this, conservative Jews do this, um, open Orthodox Jews, depending on what you hold about their methods, whether it's within Orthodoxy or not, uh, then you can argue that they do this, um, that they take the Pasuk and they, they ignore the Torah while Peh and they read it according to their own agendas. And anyone know the Rambam's gr- uh, greatest example of this, the top 10 list of the greatest distortion of any Pasuk ever? This is in Mamar Tchias Mesim. When the greatest prophet Moshe Rabbeinu intended to make known the word of Hashem, teaching that he is one and there's no second to him, and to remove from our souls the false opinions of the dualists, he stated as a clear principle of this foundational principle, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. But they, the Christians, bring a proof from this verse that God is three, saying Hashem Elokeinu Hashem is three names, and then it says Echad, thereby proving that the three are one, and that and the three is one, God forbid, okay? So... The Ramam's point here, the, the context in which he's saying this is he's saying, even God, who is omnipotent and omniscient, cannot write the Torah in a way that prevents people from deliberately misinterpreting it, right? Is you can even take the one Pasuk that tells you that God is one, and you can make it and say that God is three to fit your own agenda. Can I ask a basic, simple question that I probably should know the answer to? Uh, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve Shabbat judgment to whether to answer it now or at the end, okay? Fair enough. Yeah. Is Torah Shabbat Pet a combination of Midrash Agada and Midrash Halacha, or is it Midrash Halacha? Uh, remind me at the end. That's, it, that okay. is an important question, but I'm afraid we're going to go far afield. No okay? problem. Okay, so that is the... Um, uh, oh, I forgot to re- read the summary last time. So 
Answer number one, approach number one, was to teach a halacha about whether the skin of a dead non-Jew is permissible to derive benefit from. Approach number two, which we just read, the, the Rav Soloveitchik and the Marsha say that the point of the Midrash is to show the foolishness of the Tzedukim when they interpret Torah Shabbat without Torah Shabbat Peh. Now, that is an acceptable uh, interpretation, but are any of you bothered by it? And if so, why? You don't have to answer yes. <laughs> I'm not really bothered by it, but yeah. I guess it doesn't really make sense to spend time explaining, kind of like mocking other people. That's not really teaching you a lesson. Okay, so I, I, mm, I don't know if this is the same thing that, that is bothering you, Leah, but to me, okay, fine. You can make the point that like their method is wrong, but why do you need all of this whole anecdote of like going with a back and forth discussion just to show this one point about mockery, you know? Just say like, Sudoku misinterpret Torah uh, Shabbat you know? Like, so to my mind, it was bothering me when I read this, that there's got to be some idea in the actual Midrash. Like, I, again, I don't know Midrash like I know Mishle, but I feel like you should be able to interpret each part of the Midrash that there's ideas there, okay? Not just like you learn that you should mock uh, Tzadikim. No, sorry, Tzadikim, not, not Tzadikim. You shouldn't mock Tzadikim. All right, so this next approach uh, is from um, the Avne Nazer and the Shem Shmuel, who, according to Wikipedia, are the second and first, uh, I don't know how to say it, Sokotofer Rebbe's, who I hadn't heard of before. But if anyone says to you, oh, Rabbi Shneweis doesn't learn Hasidus, then you can say, oh, he gave a whole shir where he's quoting the, the Sokotofer Rebbe's. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, the, the um, what do you call it? So my Chavrusa and I prepared this on Yom Tov, by the way, and we found these next two slides, obviously not a slide, but we found them in a footnote, okay? So the Shemi Shmuel, who is the second Sokotrava Rebbe, says like this, Hamamar Pilai, this statement is astounding. Agreed? <laughs> Agreed. The Midrash is like a very astounding Midrash. Then he says, the Maharsha explained that each heretic said this to his fellow by way of mockery, but his words aren't reasonable, for our holy Torah is not a place to transcribe words of mockery. That sounds like what Leah is saying. It's like, you're not gonna like spend a Midrash just mocking people, okay? And then he says what I said, Rather, it is certainly the case that matters of wisdom and human teaching are alluded to here. Okay, so when my Chavruz and I discovered this, we were like, oh yeah, all right, our, our question was, was true. And it's always a good thing, by the way, when you are new in an area, like I'm new in Midrash, well, I forgot, one of my Rebbeim said this to me, that how do you know that you're on the right track in your learning development? If you try to find stuff out with your own mind, and then the Mepharshim like light up along the way. So we were working on this for a day, and then we found this, and we were like, oh, he says exactly our question. So let's see what his answer is. So he's now going to quote his, uh, the Shemi Shmuel's father, who was the first Rebbe, okay? And then he's going to expand on it on his own. So he says like this, from the mouth of my father, Rav Abraham Born Bornstein, I heard explain that this heretic held that the purpose of man is to be joyous and to celebrate. Okay, so he, okay. And Rabbi Abahu responded to him that joy and celebration are only a means to avoda to divine service, but are not the ultimate purpose of man. Okay, so right away, I mean, I don't know if you, but about you, but I'm like, ooh, okay, that he holds, what's the purpose of the Midrash? It's to teach you an idea about what the purpose of human existence is. Is the purpose of human existence Sason and Simcha, or is it Avoda? Okay, now, how does he get this from Avoda? So he says, this is alluded to with the metaphor of the skin of that man will be made into a canteen and be filled with water. Okay, now, how does that allude to a voda? I can, I can think of two explanations for how that is a marshal for a voda, like a voda sashem. What do you think? We're supposed to give of our entire self to God. So this is oh, a, liter a literal figurative. Okay, no, so yeah. that, that's actually a third approach. Okay, I hear that, right? His whole, he, his entirety should be filled with water. And water is Torah, so. Okay, so the first possibility is that water is always a marshal for Torah, right? So uh, that really water is the purpose of life, okay, meaning Torah. The other possibility is we said that the puzzle he quoted, Ubshavtem Mayim Besasson, is a reference to the Niso Hamayim, which is an avoda in the base of Mikdash. So maybe he's alluding to avoda through that, okay? So this is the first Sakha Rebbe's general interpretation, which is the purpose of man is uh, not to be joyous and celebrate, but the purpose is to do avoda. Now, this is a short interpretation and he doesn't explain every element. Now, let me explain to you what happened, okay? We found this statement, my Chavrus and I found this statement on Yom Tov, and this is all we had access to. 
So what we did is we tried, we thought that this was the, the entire commentary. So we tried to give an interpretation based on this. After Yom Tov, I found that there's several more parts to this commentary. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how the Shemi Shmuel interprets his father's words. And then I'm gonna show you how my Harusa and I interpreted these words. Okay, and they're very close, but with subtle, subtle differences. So here's what the Shemi Shmuel says. Okay, we got 15 minutes. Based on this, his approach, meaning based on his father's approach, one can explain the entire back and forth between the two heretics and between the heretic and Rabbi Bahu in the following manner. Okay, first thing he does is he defines the difference between Simcha and Sason. Simcha is that which comes to a person gradually in a calm state of mind, whereas Sason is that which comes about spontaneously. Okay, now you'll, as we go through this, you'll find that you'll get a clear idea of like what he means by these two things, by these two experiences. Um, uh, we tried to find good English words for this. And I think the best words are contentment, which in English means like a calm, like gradual, like you live a contented life. Like this is what we mean when we say like sameach v'chalko, even though, um, uh, oh, I guess that's sameach, right? That, that supports it. Sameach v'chalko, you're content in your, in your portion, okay? Sason, uh, we said is euphoria. Euphoria is like a rush of happy, intense feelings, okay? Um, then he gives a proof, which I thought is good. He says, um, uh, this is apparent from the words in the Pasuk, Sas Anochi Al Imrasecha Kamote Shal Al Rav. This is in Perak Kufiyot Tes, where David Melch is talking about the way he relates to Hashem's uh, Torah and Mitzvot. So he says, I rejoiced over your words like one who finds a great treasure. And what kind of experience do you have when you find a treasure? Euphoria, right? It's not gradual. It's not like you find a treasure like, oh, I'm content. It's like rush of happiness. Um, and he says, uh, for a finding is something that comes to a person in the moment without his prior intention. Therefore, it is called sas, and sas and sasun share a common root. Okay, so that's stage one. Simcha is contentment, and sason is, is, uh, is euphoria. Okay, so what is the argument about? It is well known that the philosophers cast off the yoke of the behavioral commandments, saying that the purpose is only that the soul should acquire good character traits. Okay, um, so... Here he's commenting on what does it mean that Sasson and Simcha are heretics. So he's saying what it means is that heretics are only concerned with using the mitzvos to get good character traits and like the ends. Okay, like for example, uh, again, best example of this is like the reform movement, right? Is that you don't have to do the mitzvos, but if, if, if you can like just get the idea from the mitzvah or the meter from the mitzvah or the experience of the mitzvah, then that's enough. Okay, so he says, these two heretics follow this approach and they only disagree on what is superior. Okay, so these are two, the, the argument between Sasson and Simcha is, is ba basically saying which experience is better, contentment or euphoria, okay? Whether it is the Simcha that comes gradually amid a calm state of mind, it takes shape in the soul, for both of them to agree that depression is a bad trait in the soul, or whether it is the Sasson that comes spontaneously, for that which comes in the moment is felt more intensely by the soul. See, so they're arguing about which one is better. Yes, if they're both rooted in Torah, like if it's a Torah euphoria versus uh, a general contentment, would he say, I feel like neither of them seems heretical if it's rooted in that. Ah, so he's learning that it's, that it's, it's without Torah. That's, he's, he's saying that the premise mm -hmm. is a life uh, of, uh, of uh, is, is experiencing this without Torah. Okay, but mm -hmm. what you're going to say is relevant to the way that my Harus and I approach it. Okay, so hold on to that thought. So it's two different types of pleasure. like Two different types of pleasure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sasun brings the puzzle of they shall attain Sasun and Simcha, which precedes Sasun to Simcha, arguing that although Sasun, sorry, that through Sasun, which comes to the soul spontaneously, Simcha will follow when the mind is in a state of calmness. Okay. Meaning Sasun is better because it will produce Simcha. And then Simcha brings the puzzle of Simcha and Sasun for the Jews, arguing that through the simcha that comes gradually in a calm state of mind and takes shape in the soul, sasan will also follow. For the soul will feel it and become excited even over something minor, as is known in the faculties of the soul. For when the soul becomes accustomed to love or exciting emotions like that, then even a small cause will excite it in love, like a wick coming in contact with a flame. So let me explain the second one first because I think it's easier to understand. When you're in love, okay, and your beloved does something very minor, like bringing you a flower, you become filled with euphoria, okay? Um, so like uh, he's arguing that if you're content with your life, then even small things will bring you euphoria, okay? Will bring you sasson. What does the sasson mean? So, so this one I don't fully understand. He's saying that through sasson, 
then Simcha will follow. I don't know exactly how that works, but that's the type of argument he's making. Maybe it means like the like the American view of what happiness is that America, and I don't say American, maybe Western is better. The American view is like happiness means peak experiences, right? And happiness with a capital H is maximizing the intensity and frequency of those peak experiences throughout your life. That's what produces a happy life. You know, that if you have enough instances of Sasson, then you get a life of Simcha. I don't know if that's what he means or he means something else, but the important thing is just to get the general approach here. Okay. So then on this topic, there is room for words for both of them. For in truth, each one has a virtue that the other one lacks. So in other words, he's explaining why this was recorded because they, they're both making good points. Sasson, which comes about spontaneously, has a greater emotional intensity than if it came gradually. On the other hand, just as it came, so it will go. It lived one night and perished after one night. So euphoria is very intense, but it's very short-lived. Simcha, which comes gradually, has the virtue of lasting longer, but it's not as intense of an emotion, right? So if you're content, in the long run, that'll be better, but you don't have these high peaks, okay? Therefore, the words of both of them were cited in Shas. Then Rabbi Abahu. It seems like the, the opposite. Yeah? From the Medjish, it seems like it's saying Simcha will be thrown out, like cast away quickly, but Sasson, well, I don't know about Sasson. Yeah, both of them use the, the, the word of being of thrown out. Uh, but the thing is, the, uh, the, the question is, what's the deal with the scout and the, um, the filling with water? And he doesn't explain that here. He only explains the filling with water for Rabia Bahu. Um, I'm going to go on in the interest of time. If we have time at the end, we'll answer questions. I just want to be sensitive to the fact I'll stay on as long as you guys want, but I don't want to hold people hostage after 1215. Um, regarding the essence of the matter, which their metaphor is about, namely that this is the purpose of man, Rabbi Bahu came and hit them on their head, saying that the matter is not so. Rather, it is like a canteen which one uses to draw water. If a person has a ready canteen, but he doesn't use it to draw water and it remains empty with him, he will die of thirst. Okay, right? If you have a canteen and you don't fill it, then there's no point in the canteen. So to hear that the soul will remain empty and bare and will go to its destruction in the Simcha and Sasson that it had while it was in this world will not benefit it. As Shlomo Melch, peace be upon him, concluded in Koheles, fear God and keep his mitzvahs for this is the entirety of man. Okay, so in other words, he's saying, Rabbi Aba, uh, sorry, uh, Sasson said to Rabbi Abahu, in Olam Haba, then you're going to bring water to me, meaning I'm going to be the head honcho and you're going to serve me. And Rabbi Abahu saying, no, no, no. You're going to be like a canteen. You're, you're like a canteen, which is that just like a canteen that doesn't have water in it, has no purpose. So too, if you live your life pursuing uh, euphoria, okay, that's going to be good in this world, but you can't take anything with you to the next world. So in, in the next world, you're going to be dead and useless. Okay, so his main point is basically comparing two types of pleasure and saying that they're not man's purpose in life. Okay, um, and he explained very nicely each part of it. There's some parts that I understand more than others, but, but this, to my mind, is like, this is what a midrash should look like, okay? Is it's giving you a nice philosophical idea. It's explaining every detail. It has to do with Torah philosophy. It's of value, you know, so that, that, that's great, okay? Um, if we have questions, hold off for now, because uh, I want to show you my approach, and then we'll, we'll officially end, and then we can ask our questions, okay? Now, remember, um, so this is me and Michael Bruce Ariel Tucker. So we only had access to this, Okay. So we tried to figure out what he meant by, by this. Okay, this is the Shemish Mool, right? So the first thing we tried to do is to define Sasson and Simcha. So again, I didn't have internet. I didn't have a concordancia. So I said to myself, I remember there being a puzzle that says, Sas Anochi Al Imra Secha, Kamote Shal Al Rav, the same puzzle that, uh, that, that he quoted. So I said, what must you say if David Melch is saying, I had Sasson over your words. So Sasson must be a psychological enjoyment. Simcha, Okay, what we say, v'samachta bechagecha and simchas yom tov is a physical enjoyment, okay? Uh, we use simcha to mean like celebrate and in, indulge in physical pleasures. So I theorize that sason is psychological enjoyment and simcha is physical enjoyment, okay? After yom tov, I found that the Rav in that same commentary defines it very similarly. He says sason in the holy language is a regish pnimi, is an internal feeling, and simcha is a ma'ase chitzoni, an external activity. And he quotes the pasuk that I quoted, okay? Sasan chiyalim resacha. And then he quotes, ki simcha teitzeu, you will go out in simcha to, to refer to the external thing, okay? Now, I don't know if the Rav meant what I meant, but it is in line with what the Rav is saying because I'm, we're both saying that sason is internal and, and simcha is external, okay? And I'm saying external means um, 
uh, you'll see what I, I mean in a second. Okay. This is the last, last slide. Okay. Uh, so this is where I'm going to explain it. So Michael Bruce and I said, we have to decode five things. What is Sason in the muscle? What is Simcha? Oh, sorry. Six things. Um, Simcha is inferior and is destined to go out and become a scout. What does that mean? S point D is Sason is inferior and is destined to be filled with water. Point E is Sason claims superiority to Rabbi Abahu, right? You guys are going to serve me water in Olam Haba. And then the last point is Rabbi Abahu makes Sason into a canteen. Okay. So my Chavrus and I came up with the following theory. Okay. And remember, we're working off that one statement in the Shem Mishmuel that says that this is about the purpose of life and whether it's pleasure or not. So we said, Sason is arguing that the purpose of life is psychological enjoyment, okay? Is to maximize the psychological pleasures, okay? Like, um, like this, the pleasure of, you know, of relationships, of love, of uh, aesthetic experiences, like art and music, okay? Um, so the, the psychological, okay? The, if you want to say it in the three parts of the soul, the ruach, okay? Simcha argues it's a life of physical enjoyment, okay? Of eating and drinking and, uh, and, and engaging in the physical pleasures, okay? The hedonistic lifestyle, all right? So that's how we were learning it, okay? That they're arguing about which one is better. So what is Simcha's argument against Sasson? Sorry, sorry, what is Sasson's argument against Simcha? What does it mean that, that Simcha has to go out as a scout? So we said here, that's pointing out a downside of the life of physical enjoyment, which means that it's inferior because it's dependent on externals, okay? Psychological enjoyment, you can get by yourself, okay? Just with your own mind, without depending on, on going out and out on the derech and out on the waterways to get stuff, okay? And this is, again, what the Stoics, those who've been following my Stoic uh, stuff here uh, on, the, on the WhatsApp group, um, the Stoics were really trying to achieve a life like this where being content with whatever you have, regardless of your external circumstances, that's the advantage of a psychologically happy life, okay? Of pursuing psychological happiness as, as the end. Okay. So then what is Simcha's argument against Sason saying that you are going to be filled with water? This is the weakest point, by the way. So if you can come up with a better explanation than me, I'm all ears, okay? Is the life of psychological enjoyment is inferior because physical needs are more primary, Okay, you can say all you want that you're going to sit there and just indulge in, psych in psychological enjoyment, but you have to eat, you have to drink, you have to procreate. So you have to do these bodily things and you can't do without them. So that really should be where you tap into your, into your pleasure in life, okay, uh, of taking care of your bodily needs. Now, maybe he's making a bigger argument than that. Maybe he's saying essentially you're an animal, so you should engage in animalistic pleasures. And like, I'm not really sure, but he's making some sort of argument saying that that, uh, that you, you Sason, have to be filled with water, meaning the life of psychological enjoyment needs water. And here we're saying water literally as an example of like a, uh, a bodily need. Okay, so that point is my weakest point. If you have feedback, I wanna hear it afterwards, but let me just finish the midrash. Okay, so now Simcha drops out of the picture and Sason challenges Rabbi Abahu, which means there's no real argument that the life of physical enjoyment is better than the life of Torah, okay? But what is Sim Sason's argument to Rabbi Abahu? So he's saying like this, Chachma's only value is as a means to pleasure, okay? Or Chachma is only good because it is the superior pleasure. So how do you see that in the mashal? Because now in this mashal, uh, water is uh, Chachma or Torah, okay? And Sasun is saying that you are going to give water to me, which means that Torah is going to serve psychological enjoyment, okay? And in fact, um, anyone know the name of the philosophical group that believed that life was all about pleasure? It starts with an E. The Epicureans, okay? Now, Epicurious, Epicurean today means that you're involved in eating and drinking, but Epicurean as a Greek philosophy um, was the life of pleasure. And what did they hold the highest pleasure is? Learning, okay? But they, the, the life of intellect, but they held that the purpose is not for truth, not for reality, but it's just because intellectual activity is the most pleasurable thing. So that's what Sasson was arguing to Rabbi Abahu. He's saying that what's the good of Torah is just to make me psychologically happy, okay? And uh, hold off on your question for one second. Let me just finish this up. And what is Rabbi Bao's uh, explanation? No, Rabbi, no, Sasson, you are a canteen to hold Torah, which means that psychological enjoyment is a means of living a life of Chachma. 
In other words, in Judaism, we hold that you should be psychologically happy. But why? Because only in a state of psychological happiness is your soul and your telling looking free to pursue Torah. So like a canteen, the purpose of which of the canteen is to hold water, to drink water, so too the purpose of a psychological enjoyable life is to be able to pursue water, which is Torah, okay? Um, and I'll go back to this slide in a second. I just want to finish it off here. So the fourth approach is comparing two philosophies of happiness and clarifying what role they play in the life of Torah. Again, very similar to the Sokotrava Rebbe's shot, but he emphasized the experiences and we, exper uh, we emphasize the lifestyle, okay? You are hereby officially dismissed. I'm not even going to see if everyone leaves because I can't see everyone right now. So don't feel like you have to wait around, but I will stay here and answer questions that you have until no one has any questions anymore. Okay. So if, if I'm saying goodbye, then have a good Shabbos. Uh, and if you have questions, then let's hear them. Um, can I bring back my question from earlier? Um, let's, uh, let's just or see. I uh, I'll go to that in a second. Anyone have any yeah. questions on either my shot or on the Sokka Shabbat Rebbe's shot in? Okay. <laughs> well, this isn't really a question, but yeah, I have, have like a. This is similar to your thing about like the Kohala and Mishle Shir Shirim triangle with Torah. Yeah. Like, is that kind of what it's similar to? Okay. Oh yes. I uh, uh, hold on. Well, it's related. It's definitely related. Mishle is showing you. Do you do you have an elaboration on that, or you're just asking if it's in the same realm? Like, do you have like a specific idea? Well, like Kohala is like what's happiness and how like whatever but this like in the triangle it's like ha happiness isn't for itself it's like uh okay um, I see what you're saying. Yeah, like, yeah. as a means to we're like right, good so 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 how would the triangle fit with this is that um that uh kohelis is telling you that the purpose of life is torah and mitzvos so that's aligning with ribia bahu okay Mishle, ironically, if anything, is really aligning with Sason because Mishle is not, doesn't care about what you want happiness for or like what your idea of happiness is. It's just showing you how to get the maximum satisfaction from life. Okay. But then Shir Shirim shows you that the ultimate happiness is found in Avas Hashem and in, in a life of Chachma. And that that's the, and that it's not for the sake of happiness. It's really for the sake of knowledge. And then it results in happiness. I don't know if that answers your, the, the connection you were making uh, or, or not, but that, that's how I see it in my mind. Yeah. With it. What did you say about Kohalat again? Ko Kohalat is, is Kohala. showing you what to pursue in life, which is, uh, he says, Yeras Hashem and Mitos. Okay. Um, but he's not really highlighting. Isn't that really just the last passage? Yeah, but that's the conclusion of Kohalat, though. It's found at the last passage, but it's the conclusion of the entire book. Yeah. Um, and he's also showing you that that making your life about anything else is going to lead to Hevel. So it's not that you should be Samech B'chalko? Um, That's not the conclusion. So Samech B'chalko is, uh, is a component of that. Excuse me. But um, but it's not the ultimate happiness uh, because Samech B'chalko does not uh, include Av Hashem. That's why you need to sh share Hashem. Samech B'chalko is the end of Kohelis, but not the end of man. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Ale, I saw you on mute. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So is this Chachma, is this saying that Chachma is a type of pleasure? Yes. Chachma is a type of psychological pleasure. And uh, this is something that um, uh, is a uh, trigger warning. Um, uh, if you think that when you learn Torah, you're engaged in spiritual pleasure, the Ramam would say, nope. Because <laughs> the Ramam in Perek Chelek says, that the only place we can in, have a spiritual pleasure is in Olam Haba, because in Olam Hazeh, the only kind of pleasure we experience is psychological or physical. So even when you're learning Torah, that's, or you're davening, or you're like having, doing a mitzvah, that's psychological pleasure. Now it's psychological pleasure from a spiritual activity, but it is psychological pleasure. So that's how Sasson can make his argument because he's saying that when you are involved in water and you're involved in learning and Torah and Avoda, the only value in that is, is the psychological pleasure, pleasure that it brings. We don't care about reality and truth and living objectively in line with the good and justice. It's just pleasure. Which means that it could be a means for Torah. Like if well, that's like what we've only engaged as an experience and it appeals, right. Right. Yeah, Leah? Wait, I missed what Shinalia said. 
you would be it. Yeah, um, I was saying that it still can serve, a, it's just a tool um, towards living. Like if, if, if it appeals to your intellect, then you would live along with it. And it's enjoyable. But it's a small yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just to articulate the two parts of this bullet point, Sassana will say that there's only two reasons to pursue Chachma. Mm -hmm. Number one, Chachma is a means to a life of pleasure. That's Mishle that if you use Chachma, you'll get more pleasure out of everything else in life. And then number two is Chachma is the greatest pleasure, but that's the only reason why it's valuable because learning is fun, okay? There's a, a story that, um, so one of the rabbis that were responsible for my family uh, discovering Orthodox Judaism is Rabbi Lapin. And Rabbi Lapin is from South Africa and was raised in a very South African, like, like old Europe style yeshiva, you know, like a bringing, uh, like real Lidvish. So he said when he was a kid, his father took him um, on a walk on Shabbos and showed him these old men sitting on the porch on Shabbos, smoking cigarettes with Gemaras and learning Gemara, okay? And the point that his father was making to him is this is, this is the opposite of Torah Lishma. This is when you are not learning Torah and living in order to live it because it's true and good is you're just learning it for the intellectual pleasure. That's it. And you don't care about how you live. Like these guys kept learning Gemara, even though they abandoned Judaism because they, it was pleasurable, but they weren't interested at all in truth and goodness and reality and like God's will, you know? So that's like how Sasson is looking at, uh, at Torah just for the pleasure. So the Chachma of Torah is really just because it's the best pleasure that there is out there? That's how Sassim is viewing it. But Rabbi Abahu is correcting him and saying, no, no, no. It's true that Chachma is the greatest pleasure, that's Shir Shirim, but the purpose of, uh, of, of the truth is truth, okay? And, and, and that, that's the Ram's thing. Is, MS el -ladashu MS. The only purpose of truth is to know that it is true. And the pleasure follows from that. Okay, but the purpose of it is Torah Lishma and to live in line with it. Okay, that's what Rabbi Bao's argument is. And Rabbi Bao was saying that the purpose of being psychologically happy ultimately is so that you could be in the best state to learn Torah. Does that make sense, Leah? Okay, so then, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, but then all you're doing, but then like, what's the purpose of finding the objective truth? Ah, that's gonna have to be a, a bigger discussion, okay? About lishma and shalom lishma. Um, we, uh, we can do that in part of our Pirke Abbas in Jewish ethics, okay? Uh, it's an important question. I'll have to pick which mitzvah it comes up in, or sorry, which uh, mishnah it comes up in, but it definitely comes up in, uh, in uh, Pirke Abbas, okay? So I owe you, all right? Believe that. <laughs> all right. Okay, any other questions on this before we go to Shane Leah's question? Okay, um, let me just uh, stop sharing the screen to get to set up the answer here um, because I have to show you a Ramban. Um, and just note that if you speak, you will be recorded on YouTube for all eternity or until Google goes out of business. Um, on. Find it. Oh, wait, maybe I saved it on my computer. Just one second. Yes, I saved it on my computer. Okay, so the Ramban here, I'll, um, first of all, let me just share the screen uh, so that you can talk without worry. All right, so um, Shayla, repeat your question. Uh, just make sure I got it. I'm just recollecting my thoughts. Sure. Um, I mean, I can repeat it, but uh, you want me to repeat it and you tell me if this is what you're asking? Sure. Is Midrash Agata part of Torah Shabal Peh? Yes. Okay. So the Ramban in his uh, Vikuach, in his dispute with Pablo Christiani, uh, so this is the, the famous debate, right? So Pablo Christiani tried to prove the Trinity, okay? And uh, he brought proofs from the Pesukim, and then Ramban like shot them all down, uh, like, cause he's Ramban. And then Pablo Christianity brought proofs from Midrash, okay? So the Ramban responds like this, okay? Uh, I got up and I said, Shimu Amim Kulam. Listen, everyone. Frey Paul Sha'alanani, Inkvar Baha Mashiach, Shadibru Bohanavim. So Friar Paul 
uh, said the Mashiach has already come. The Mashiach that the Nevi'im talked about has already arrived. The Amarti, and I said, Shalobah, he didn't come. Okay, the Hevi Sefer Agada. So uh, Friar Paul brought out a book of a Midrashim. Sha'amar Bo, uh, of, of a Gadic Midrashim. Sha'amar uh, Bo, which said is in it, Ki bayom shachar of Mikdash, Bo bayom nolad. That on the day the Beis Mikdash was destroyed, that's the day that the Mashiach was born. Okay, I don't know how that exactly works because the Beis Mikdash was destroyed in the year 70 and Jesus was born like before that. So I don't know about that, but whatever. The Amarti ani she'eni mam in Vizah. So what did the Ramban say? I don't believe that. Meaning, I don't believe the Midrash, okay? So now he explains. Du, you should know. We have three types of books. Remember, this is in Spain, right? So the first one is the Biblia, which is the Bible. We all believe in the Bible uh, with complete emunah. So that's what we call Torah Shavik okay? Vasheni hu anikra Talmud. The second one is, is called Talmud. Who pirush mitzvos a Torah? This is an explanation of the mitzvos of the Torah. Ki b'tori yesh tariag mitzvos ve'ein ba achas shalonis parsha b'talmud. And in the Torah there are six hundred thirteen mitzvos, and there's not a single one that is not explained in the Talmud. Va'nachnu ma'aminim bo b'fersh mitzvos. And we believe in the Talmud in the explanation of the mitzvos. Okay, meaning the the parts of the Talmud that explain the mitzvos, that part we believe in. Okay. Od yesh lanu sefer shlishi hanikra. Midrash. We also have a third book, really a third category book called Midrash. Rotolomer Sermones. Okay, or Sermones is the English word. Hermeneutics? Uh, that's the English word for Midrash. Oh. Sermon. Sermons. Okay, right? Drusho, sermons, right? That, that like uh, rabbis and, uh, and, and uh, pastors give. Okay. Kamoshi in Yamud Hahegamon, like if a, uh, 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 a leader gets up, Vyase Sermon Echad, and he gives a sermon. Okay, he gives a drasha, he gives a Dora Torah. The Echamina Shomim Hayatobe in Abukaswa. And one of the listeners said, Oh, this is good, and he writes it down. Vizeha Sefer, and this book, meaning Agadita, Mishi Yamin Boto, if you believe in it, it's good. Mishi Lo Yamin Bo, Lo Yazik, and if you don't believe in it, you're not going to be harmed. So exactly the same as Shmuel Hanagid, right? Or not exactly the same, but very, very close, which is Shmuel Hanagid says, anything that you find in the Talmud that is an explanation of a mitzvah, that we have to believe in. But if it is not of a mitzvah, then if you believe in it, good. And if not, then not. The only difference is that the Ramban is putting it in terms of like, um, if you, uh, good and bad. And Shmuel Hanagid is mm-hmm. putting it in terms of, do you have to rely on it or not? Right. So how do we make of this in light of the approach number one? where misidentifying an right. agada for um, a halacha. Right. So th- this is one of the questions that is open to me, which is, uh, that, which is still an open question mark to me, which yeah. is that um, there are definitely cases where um, posts can bring down halachic ramifications of what appear to be midrashe agada, okay? Mm-hmm. And in fact, sometimes you'll find that even in the post game is that one post will say, you have to do this according to halacha, and the other one will say, no, that source is just a midrash agada. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, so it seems like that is a realm of intuition based on your knowledge of Agata and Halakha. Um, And that's why I said when I quoted approach number one, that the person who came up with the approach has learned way more Talmud than I have. So maybe he has a different intuition. Um, So I guess he held that that was a a Halakha thing, but everyone agrees you don't derive Halakha from Agata. But you just don't know what Agata is necessarily. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And regarding another part of your question, which I th- either you said or I, I thought you said, mm-hmm. is the halakhic midrashim, where do they fall out? So halakhic midrashim are part of Torah Shabbat Right. Yeah. So I think the difficulty that I'm still left with and that I just need to pursue more learning is how I can parse through to understand what, which is which. Meaning, yeah. Torah Sh- Talmud has both Agadatas and Hilchatas. Right. right. But the Torah Shabbat Peh is the Hilchata, which the Agadata is mixed into. Yeah, it's mixed. That's the difficulty. It's, it's mixed into the same text, okay? That and really, that, that's, com- that's confusing. Yeah, it's confusing. And that's why your, your greatest barometer is to consult the postkin. If the post can bring it down, then at least you've got a basis for saying that this is a halakhic statement. And, and in other words, like, that's really where to look. In other words, not even looking in the commentaries on the, on the Midrashim themselves, 
just look at the Amish front near Mitzvah, mm -hmm. okay, in the Shas. If he leads you to the Shulchan Aruch and the Torah and the Rambam, so then chances right. are that this is halacha, and if not, then it's it's a gadata, you know. And then occasionally you'll get someone who who quotes something as uh, as one or the other, or or that you have a dispute. But yeah, something we, we, we need to develop our intuition about that on a case by case basis. So when Sudukim re um, reject Torah Shabbat, Pat, they are both rejecting um, the Agarita and the Elchatos. Exactly, yeah, they were. And, and furthermore, if you ask the Rambam, the Rambam does not include would not say that Agata, I mean, R Rambam is like the Rambam, Ramban here. Rambam would not say that Torah Shabbat, that uh, Agata is Torah Shabbat, Pat. Mm. Okay, you'd say that Torah Shabbat is Davka, like if you look in the beginning of the Mishnah Torah, is, um, it's the perush of the mitzvahs in Torah Shabbat So mm -hmm. it's halachic. Uh, and so anything that's not halachic, the Ram would say is not Torah Shabbat uh, Pah. And that's why like, I feel like it's, um, it is a, a misunderstanding. Look, there's some people who hold that all contents of the Talmud were given at Sinai. Okay, unlike mm -hmm. Shmuel Nagid, and they hold that even Agadahs were given at, uh, at Sinai, and therefore they hold that if you deny an Agada or you reject an Agada or you don't believe in an Agada, that you're rejecting Torah Shabbat Peh and you're a kofar. Right. Now, Ramban clearly is not saying that, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't believe it, then that's fine. So according to them, th that's like a different understanding of what Agada is and what Torah Shabbat Peh is, because they're saying that Agada is not theories of the authors, and they're saying it's part of the Torah Shabbat Peh where we say that someone's co is uh, is not picorous, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, that's like a radically different view, but there are yeah. Jews who hold that, you know? So that idea always confused me and I was trying to understand what, like, how does that work? Like they hold that the, um, the rabbis that are written to say what is an agadita is them giving over an idea given at Sinai or that that whole thing that's in writing was verbal and then written down? Um, is there a nafkamina between those two? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, cause the other possibility, by the way, also is that they, like, here's another way to put it. Okay. is like, let's say in this case here, so they would hold that just like God says, ayin tachas ayin means mamon. And just like God says that pre hadar means, uh, citron and, just like God gave those Pirushim of those Psukim to Moshe, so too, when it says, Ki besimcha teitseu, and Sasun is better than Simcha, and they're making you to canteen, that was also right. given to you know, in the same type of Drasha fashion. Like, that's the authoritative explanation of this Pasa, you know? So Sasun and Simcha and Rabbi Abahu would both be vehicles of, like, characters as metaphors. Yeah, so that, that part I'm not I exactly get confused sure. with the terminology. It's confusing because, like, let's say, you know, if you're going to hold that a God was given at Sinai, well, in, if you notice in our Midrash here, there are no Pesukim quoted from Chumash. It's all from Nach, right? Right. So, like, when was that given, you know? And, yeah. And, and Rabbi Abahu, like, the Mesorah Abahu, and the chain is a little bit wrong. Yeah, no one knew Rabbi Abahu's name at Sinai. I mean, unless you're going to say right. that Rabbi Abahu was given at Sinai. And look, people who take this to the, look, there are people who believe that the Avos kept every detail of halacha, right. including Durbanas and Minhagim. That's and that was all given at Sinai. So like the, the limit to what people believe is given at, at Sinai, or let's say people who believe that Moshe Rabbein received every single machlokas that ever could come up. You know, mm -hmm. if you have machlokas Hillel and Shammai, if you have machlokas between Rav Moshe and, and the Rav, that was given to Moshe at Sinai. And I don't know how you can believe that that was given to Moshe at Sinai, but people do say that that is, you know, that they believe that. So I guess, you know, that's the, like the extremist position of what was given at Sinai. Fascinating. And it's also interesting because it feels like a self, like an almost like self-generated idea because it it's very meta because they're ho they're holding this idea of how to interpret the whole complex um I don't even like Torah. Yeah. Um but then I, I, let me just give you a muscle that I think describes yeah. what you're saying is um, there's a phrase that's used by Chazal, and I don't know what it's used in reference to, mountains hanging on threads. Um, and I, I, I feel like this type of fundamental machalokas in methodology or in premises is like mountains hanging on threads. Like if you say, like Shmuel HaNagid, that we only accept from Agadita that which makes sense, right. or if you say, no, you must accept everything in Agadita as Torah Misenai, that's going to lead you into two radically different Judaisms, you know, yeah. essentially, I mean, not Judaisms, but like, sources excuse me of your Schools duty of thought. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it's, it is a big mock locus you know and in terms of like what you you know this is the classic thing with any big mock locus like that 
when you were in in uh, in my Jewish ethics class, did were, was I doing the, the schools of Judaism yet, like rationalism and traditionalism? Yes. And, right. That must have been one of the first years I did it. So I remember um, uh, a student said after we did the three schools, she said, "How do you know which one is right?" You know, and I said, "Well, the rationalists will tell you to follow your mind. Exactly. The traditionalists will tell you." look in the Masora and the blind faith people would say, follow your, your, you know, what, what does your, your heart tell you, you know? So it's like, what methodology do you use to, to, to figure out your methodologies? To you try know? to tap into that objective truth that Leia was talking about. It always yeah. comes down to that. Exactly. And so I think the best you can do again is like, learn the different opinions and then your intuition will be drawn to one or the other and develop you can't get out of the intuition like the, like i feel like everything that i keep searching for is how to remove the self from it but you just can't no and that's why you know that's why the key is not you can't get away from intuition but the key is that there's layman's intuition and then there's uh Chacham's intuition and your goal should be to expose yourself to enough interpretations of Chachamim that your mm -hmm. layperson's intuition becomes shaped and influenced and then becomes a Chacham or a navon's uh intuition you know in every area. A full life's journey. Full life's journey, exactly. <laughs> yep. And that's that's why I designed this sheer like this of showing these different interpretations of this midrash because I think it does show that there are, you know, these are all kahamim and like their mm -hmm. minds took them in these radically different directions and you get these different results, you know? And that's all you can Thank do. Thank you. I've I've been trying to I, I've been intrigued by Midrash and I've been confused by Agata. Yeah. And so I, I'm I'm looking forward to this uh series.